Welcome to today's SCA webinar with Dr. Larry Lake and Dr. Jerry Jensen on why a no geology model helps us to understand geology. I'd like to remind the audience today that you are muted, but you can ask questions during the presentation using the GoToWebinar question feature. We'll cover the Q&A at the end of the presentation and you will be anonymous. This presentation is why a no geology model helps us understand geology. And today our speakers are Drs. Larry Lake and Jerry Jensen. Dr. Lake is a professor at UT Austin in the Department of Petroleum and Geoscience, Geosystems Engineering. He holds the Shahid and Sharon Ula Chair. He has BS and PhD degrees in chemical engineering from Arizona State and Rice, respectively, and he is the author or co-author of more than 100 technical papers, four textbooks, and the editor of three bound volumes. Larry has served on the board of directors for SPE. He won the Lucas Award, the Goyer Distinguished Service Award. He's an SP honorary member, and he's been a member of the National Academy of Engineers since 1997. He won the SPDOE IOR Pioneer Award in 2000. Dr. Jerry Jensen is a researcher with the Bureau of Economic Geology at UT Austin. He held the Schulich Chair in Geostatistics at the University of Calgary's Department of Chemical and Petroleum Engineering. Prior to 2007, Jerry was also a member of faculty at Texas A&M and Harriet Watt. He also worked as a field engineer for Schlumberger and Gerhardt. Jerry, has taught industry short courses on a number of topics, including geomechanics, well log interpretation, geological statistics, reservoir characterization, and petrophysics. Jerry received a BS in electrical engineering from the University of Birmingham in the UK and a PhD in petroleum engineering from UT Austin in 1986. He's the author or co-author of 100 publications, including the book Statistics for Petroleum Engineers and Geoscientists, and Applied Reservoir Engineering and Characterization. Jerry has research and teaching interests in interwell connectivity, petrophysical analysis of unconventional reservoirs, and strategic sampling for reservoir analysis and modeling. Jerry was an SP Distinguished Lecturer on the topic of interwell connectivity. The class that Dr. Lake and Dr. Jensen teach for SEA is called Managing Mature Oil Fields with Capacitance Resistance Modeling, or CRM. That class is being offered in a public format uh, September 6th and 7th in SCA's Houston Training Center. You can see the description of the class listed here. If you would like to have this class taught either in a live on format, live online format, or uh, in a private class in-house, we can arrange that as well. Uh, looking ahead, the next free webinars are uh, starting in June. We have Robert Shelley uh, speaking on June 20th on artificial neurosystems that provide Wolf Camp completion design insight. And we have a webinar with a date yet to be announced with Dr. Spiril Dinderuk and Dr. Sylvia Levescu on geothermal energy. Live online classes that are coming up, uh, we have a geomechanics aspects of CCS projects. That's offered in half-day formats, June 6 through 8, with uh, Dr. Everton Arujo, Dr. Jorge Pastor, and Dr. Furman Fernandez Ibanez. And then we have energy transition for petroleum professionals. Again, it's offered in a half-day format, and there are several uh, days there in July, six half days and that's offered by Dr. Nathan Meehan. In July, uh, Dr. John Lee has two classes that are offered in live online format. Again, the half day format, production forecasting for low perm reservoirs and PRMS and SEC reserves and resource regulations. So don't hesitate to contact SCA if you would like to arrange for any of these courses to be taught in house or if you're looking for any other types of training. And in addition to training, SCA provides consulting, uh, projects and studies, and direct hire services. And so I am going to pass the presentation rights to Dr. Lake. And we can start the presentation. Larry, you should have the presentation rights. 
Thank you, Susan. It's a pleasure to uh, <clears throat> to show this uh, this audience the work that uh, Jerry and I have been doing for about the last 15 years. Uh, it's kind of an interesting little line of inquiry and something that we hope is useful. Well, that's just great. So <clears throat> yeah, you've heard the introduction of the title and, and introductions of myself and Jerry. It uh, was and continues to be a research project. And like every good research project, it should have a hypothesis. And the hypothesis is that the characteristics of a reservoir, characteristics of a reservoir will largely be centered around the subject of connectivity. The characteristics of a reservoir can be inferred from analyzing only production and injection data. Most of the time that's production and injection rates, but sometimes we have uh, bottom hole pressures as well. And this in part comes from, uh, uh, <clears throat> comes from the experience that many times, particularly with legacy assets, there's virtually no data available except for production and injection data. And so uh, this is an attempt to do something with that. You'll see some other comments later on about parsimonious models and, and things like that. But first of all, why do we call it capacitance resistance? Well, first of all, we call it that because way a long time ago in the 1940s, uh, before the advent of digital computers, people used to actually build capacitance and resistance circuits uh, to model the flow through a reservoir. You, you can see in the lower left corner the schematic diagram that uh, shows the resistance and the capacitance in here in the upper right hand corner it shows a photograph of, of an actual one of these things it's pretty large in here and this is basically analog representations of flow through a reservoir it uh, did a pretty good job as you look over here on the on the lower left you can see that um, this is an attempt to match the flow rates of a reservoir. Well, we're not solving electrical circuits here, but we are solving analogs to it. The resistance would be a permeability, or we shall see connectivity, and the capacitance will be compressibility. And we're not solving it with an analog, we're solving it with a, a numerical, as we'll see in the next slide. So there's a cartoon reservoir on the right-hand side. In the upper left-hand corner is the continuity equation, which says N minus out is equal to accumulation, and the accumulation is tied to the average pressure. Uh, as is true for all of these things, it's, it requires a closure relationship, and the closure relationship here is the standard productivity formula. Q is equal to a productivity index times drawdown pressure here. Q in this uh, in this presentation here is the total rate, both oil plus water, and you can tell that we're thinking you know, largely about water floods, but as you will see, we've uh, tried it on other things too. Those two equations can be combined to form uh, that equation. The parameter in that equation is the productivity index, but most importantly here is the time constant, which is the total compressibility assumed constant times the core volume divided by the productivity index of the producer over here. This equation, because we've made so many assumptions to uh, get to it, this equation has an analytic solution, which is here. It's kind of in daunting when you see it the first time, but there are physical interpretations to each of the three terms. For example, the first term here is just depletion flow. That's basically like a decline, a primary production decline uh, as a consequence of the pressure that's in the reservoir. The second term here is the response to the injection rate, and you will notice down in here is the injection rate as a function of time. And then the third term here is changes in the bottom hole pressure over a time step times the productivity index, and that's changes in the bottom hole pressure. It's been a rare case where we have actually bottom pressure data. We just have, have some, and, and we'll show it to you. Uh, but in most of the cases that we have done, this term is uh, neglected. So the parameters of the problem will be the time constant up here and the connectivity here, which 
are discussed in the next slide. Connectivity is the fraction of the fluid going to a producer that came from a particular uh, injector. And the time constant is, as we've defined before, compressible core volumes uh, times our productivity index. It's uh, kind of interesting to me, anyhow, to compare this back to current practice. And so this slide says conventional world on the left side, and below that is the standard diffusivity equation. <clears throat> which has a diffusivity that contains in it both a permeability and a porosity, and we'll call this conventional world or permeability porosity world. On the right side is CRM world, and the uh, as we said on the previous slides, the parameters are not permeability, they're not porosity, they're time constant, which is an analog to porosity, and then their connectivity, which is an analog to uh, permeability. But you can see the similarities between this and the, these things over here. And mostly the reason behind stating this is to emphasize the fact that these are physically based models that may not have the things that you're familiar with in it, but it does have things that you in it that, that are very useful and that uh, you depends on things that you'll be familiar with. So here's the way it works. Suppose we have a time varying injection rate over here on the left, which results in a time varying production rate. And schematically, here's production. It shows you the injection here in the blue square curves. It shows you the production right here. And uh, what we're going to be doing is showing you basically the results of a standard reservoir engineering practice, namely histomatching. We're going to adjust the parameters of the model so that it matches uh, the field data. Now, the, the parameters will be time constant and connectivity, but there will be one of these for each injector producer pair in the time, time of terms of the connectivity, and one of these for every producer. So there can be quite a large number of unknowns, but they're still just inject, uh, inject uh, connectivity and, and time constant. What's different here is that the model is so simple that we can fit the data with uh, relatively simple techniques. Uh, many times we just use the, the solver routine in Excel. Uh, for larger models, we'll have to uh, use a more sophisticated uh, fitting routine, but there isn't any real limit to how many wells that we can take. So these are not sector models or single well models. We can really take the entire reservoir with uh, capacitance resistance. Now I'm going to stop right there and let, let Jerry move in so that uh, we can talk about more results. Okay, thank you, Larry. Um, so I'll give Jerry the presentation rights. Thank you. Okay, so uh, now that Dr. Lake has uh, kind of yeah, please back put them in show mode in presentation mode, Jerry. Full screen. There we go. Thanks. Okay. So now that Dr. Lake has uh, pulled back the curtain on the nuts and bolts of the capacitance resistance model for a measurement of connectivity, um, the rest of this presentation is going to discuss connectivity applications. For my part, I'm going to uh, offer some context for connectivity evaluation and show some examples where the combination of connectivity and uh, geoscience data will help us understand which geological features are affecting the injector producer uh, interactions. And then Larry is going to close with some of his examples of connectivity evaluation for field cases. So to begin with, um, I've listed here some of the different names we see for connectivity in the uh, in the literature, and uh, uh, this is can be a confusing thing for people who are who are wanting to uh, to start out understanding what connectivity is. There's so many different names, and I this is not an exhaustive list, but I've tried to organize them by uh, listing them according to whether they suggest there's too much connectivity, they're fairly neutral about it, 
or whether they suggest it's too little connectivity. So we think, see things such as steep zones and bypassed regions suggesting that uh, there's too much connectivity somewhere in the field. Uh, stringers, compartmentalization, and barriers all suggest that there is too little connectivity. Now, in the in the full course that Larry and I offer, we we talk about uh, a number of field cases where we're using connectivity uh, with other information. And uh, since my particular uh, interest is in combining connectivity with uh, geoscience data, then, um, then uh, this is what I have emphasized for connectivity applications uh, in, uh, in bold lettering here. So mo uh, model testing and improvement, geostatistical realization screening, comparing competing geological models and assessing the impact of geological characteristics, uh, as well as some field management activities that we can usefully uh, use in, uh, connectivity information, such, such as injecting, adjusting injection rates, uh, infill drilling, and assessing the need or the effectiveness of remedial measures. Now, we and neither Larry nor I wish to claim that the capacitance resistance model is the only way to measure connectivity. The, the whole host of methods. Uh, we think our uh, CRM has some advantages over some of the others. And uh, I think those will come out as we as we discuss the uh, field cases uh, in this presentation and in the, the, the larger course. So among the uh, pressure disturbance type measurements of connectivity, we have multi-well productivity index, interference tests, and the capacitance resistance model. But we, we also acknowledge that the fluid flow models, such as reservoir simulation, are also uh, use can be useful tools. Now, the issue with, uh, with behind the capacitance resistance model is that it is an opportunistic method, which exploits the fact that injection rates naturally change over the life of a water flow. So here I have in this plot here, I have injection rates on the vertical axis versus time, and you see how the injection rates for this particular water flood are changing. Now, the causes for those changes uh, are not entirely clear. Some changes are due to seasonal variations in uh, availability of surface water, for example, or operational disturbances uh, where equipment problems or maintenance uh, uh, causes a change in injection rate. But whatever the cause, we uh, in the CRM, we want to use these variations as, uh, as indications of inner well connectivity by looking at the producers at the production rates and the fluctuations we see in the producers due to these variations in injection rates. So here is a diagram, much like uh, Larry showed earlier on, where we have an injection well and a production well, and we're using uh, a weight lambda, which is less than or equal to one, uh, measuring the influence of the injection on this producer. And we have the material balance, as Larry has described. So we also note that there is this time delay. We have to account for time delay between what happens at the injector and the response of the producer. And if we have a very small value of tau in our system, so maybe low compressibility, then the uh, production rate will change uh, in kind of a step function, just like we see in the injection pulse, just slightly attenuated. On the other hand, if we have a large compressibility system, uh, then we uh, see a delayed response of the producer as well as a smeared out uh, wave uh, in the response. 
Now, we calculate the lambdas and taus, as Larry has said, uh, using some uh, nonlinear optimization software. And uh, the, the basic idea is that uh, we want to take some history, some historical performance period for the, uh, for the field, and we want to see if we can determine the lambdas and taus, which will give as good a match as possible between the, the actual performance and the CRM results. And so that amounts to minimizing this sum here, where we take the measured minus the CRM predicted rate, square that difference up over, and sum it up over all times. And so we might get something that looks like this. Here's 10 years of water flood history versus the production rate. And you see the measured values are of production are in uh, the green and the gold shows the CRM model predictions. Now we do this over uh, the uh, whole area of, of a field or the field itself. So here, for example, we have about six injectors and about a dozen producers. And I've taken four of those producers and shown you the match of the CRM uh, which is in brown versus the measured production rate, which is in green. And you see that there's a fairly good match. It's not perfect, but there's a fairly good match. And indeed, there's even a fairly good match for this well here in the northwest corner, which was shut in for some period of time. And the CRM was able to, to uh, cope with that, that change. So we can test whether the tau's and lambdas are actually capturing the interaction between injectors and producers within a field by doing what we call uh, cross-validation. So here uh, we're taking seven years of that 10-year water flood production, and we're using just the seven years to match uh, with, the, with the CRM. And then, since we have three years of injection rates that we haven't uh, that we haven't used in determining the tiles and lambdas, then we can run the model forward. And in, in this case, you see that there's a pretty good match between the CRM predicted rate of, of production and the actual performance. So that's one way that we can uh, confirm. To our satisfaction, the lambdas and taus are not just uh, numbers that, that represent some mathematical minimization, but actually capture uh, the injector producer interaction in the reservoir. We can also look at the lambdas and taus and how they uh, relate to the geological characterization of the reservoir. And I'm just going to look at the lambdas because of the the, uh, the need for short uh, time here. So what we do is we create vector maps, um, in this case using the lambdas, the scale bar is down in the lower left, and the injectors are represented by triangles, the producers are represented by open circles, and for example this injector here um, has a long arrow uh, pointing towards this producer, and the length of that arrow is related to the value of lambda that this injector has with this producer. And you see that this injector has a much weaker uh, connectivity uh, with this producer down here. And you see varying levels of connectivity throughout this field. And what's useful is to put a geological signature overlay that on this sort of a map and you see here this is just the gross sand thickness map so you see the uh, the limits of the field here at zero meters thickness six and seven meters thickness in the central part of this tidal channel dominated part of the reservoir and then we have some other fasces over here in the northeast and the southeast but if we focus 
for the moment, just on this western part, um, we can look at uh, whether there are any directional sensitivities of the connectivity. And what we see when we produce a rose diagram is that the largest connectivities are in the north, northwest, south, southeast direction. And as it turns out, that is the very similar direction, orientation, that uh, Zaitlin and Schultz uh, published in 1990 by looking at cores and logs from this western part of the field here. So what we're looking at is the tidal channels have a preferred orientation, they're elongated in the northwest southeast direction, and it turns out that that, uh, that channel orientation is, uh, is helping to control the connectivity between injectors and producers. Now, when I talk to my uh, geoscience colleagues and describe to them uh, what I'm doing with connectivity evaluation, they ask me oftentimes, oh, you know, so how do you incorporate the geological information into your model? And I reply that, well, no, the CRM doesn't have a geological model. It, it, it doesn't have any information about the geology in it. And they uh, oftentimes roll their eyes and say, well, you know, typical engineer ignoring the geology again. And what I have to do is say, no, actually this is a strength of the CRM because when we come to compare the connectivity results with the geological models, then we have really two independent sources of characterization and we look for coincidence and we look for discrepancies and that insight then gives us uh, in, uh, insights into uh, what are the controlling features for our particular reservoir. There can be lots of geological characteristics from the very small scale to the very large scale, uh, but the CRM is going to give insight into what is controlling the injective producer interaction. Now, the connectivity evaluation can be used uh, in other circumstances as well, and Larry's going to talk about some of those situations here in a few minutes. But I will say that um, what we have found is that when we apply CRM to a water flood and then uh, adjust the water flood injection rates accordingly, uh, what we often see is an improvement in water flood recovery, something of the order of three to eight percent oil enhancement. Now, in the main course, we look at a whole variety of different case studies, everything from heavy oil to conventional oil, tide oil, uh, conventional and unconventional primary uh, recovery processes. So we get a whole range of different cases which we uh, which we speak to. Uh, just to give you a little flavor of, of what uh, a tight oil water flood result might look like in terms of connectivity and uh, integration with, uh, with uh, geoscience data, here's, here's one case that we talk about in the, in the main course. Uh, this is in the Williston Basin. It's a Bakken uh, production and a very low permeability reservoir, very complicated geology. And by that, I'm, by complicated, what I mean is there are a whole host of different ways that, that uh, fluid flows through the reservoir. There can be fractures, there can be uh, activated faults, there can be silts, and, and so on. So. So it's, it's kind of an interesting study. And, uh, and as it turns out, the seismic uh, information that was taken over this field is, uh, is quite useful. Here is the area of uh, study. The red horizontal wells are the ones included in the study. Every other well is an injector. And uh, what we did was we looked at the seismic acoustic impedance uh, to compare with the connectivity. Now, for those of you whose uh, 
knowledge of seismic is maybe a little weak, let me remind you acoustic impedance is the product of density and velocity. And, uh, and that relates then to the porosity of the formation. And in the case of the uh, Bakken, it's to the presence of natural fractures in the reservoir. So larger acoustic impedance applies, implies lower porosity and fewer fractures. So here are the results that, uh, that we were getting. A connectivity on the vertical axis, the maximum seismic impedance on the horizontal axis. And uh, what we see is uh, a relationship where as the seismic impedance decreases, we're seeing more fracture porosity and we're seeing more opportunities for connectivity between the injector and the producer. Now, this is the maximum size and impedance, and so we, we talk about the reason why we use that rather than uh, just an average size and impedance in the main course. Um, but anyway, what we would uh, suggest here is that we can use the seismic to give us some insight into what the well spacing ought to be in, uh, in this Bakken Reservoir. So where we have um, we have uh, abundant or, or more abundant uh, fracturing, then we have uh, better inner well connectivity, and so we can space the horizontal wells further apart compared to this uh, part of the reservoir down here, where the seismic is telling us that, uh, that the porosity is less and therefore fractures are less abundant and so we have to place our wells closer together. Now to uh, kind of close my part on a philosophical note here, um, I have plotted up down here uh, the data needs versus the model sophistication on the horizontal axis and I've plotted various methods, various tools reservoir engineers use uh, to characterize uh, reservoir fluid flow. And you see down here, down in the, in the minimum data, simple methods, we see material balance, CRM, and so on. Uh, full field simulation, streamlines, et cetera, are up here in the northeastern part of that plot. And uh, so the CRM is working down here and so it's relatively limited demand on data and preparation. It isn't, it isn't terribly sophisticated, but it, uh, it is a way that, uh, that gives us a, offers us a simple model that might explain the injector producer behavior we see in the reservoir. And if that works well, then that's reduced the amount of time and pre-processing that we needed to, uh, to get on with our field development. So parsimony is the, is the characteristic where you use the simplest possible model to explain the reservoir behavior. And Larry will say a little bit more about that later on in his part of the presentation. Thank you, and over to you, Larry. Okay. Goodness gracious. There we go. So uh, thanks, Jerry. Great. I want to finish up our talk here with uh, uh, a couple of uh, things that, uh, uh, that I think are kind of interesting and sort of wraps up the whole picture. As has been said several times, you get a lot more detail on these things if you take the full three-day course. Uh, but the first thing I'd like to uh, talk about is the bottom hole pressure effect. I said earlier that uh, we oftentimes don't have bottom hole pressures, but particularly if we're dealing with a fairly modern asset, we, we do. And so here is uh, a, cut, a set of pressure and rate data for four wells. And you can see the pressure is the green dots, the rate is the, the pink dots. As Jerry suggested earlier, if we got to have some variability in the, in the uh, 
in, in the rates. And uh, fortunately, that's really not a problem usually. Uh, but in this case, there's variability in the pressures as well. And so if we use the uh, pressure data only, this is a plot of rate versus time. The, uh, <clears throat> the field data are the dots, the uh, CRM matches are the solid lines. We get this, which is a pretty good fit. Uh, not not bad at all. In fact, I think the regression coefficient on this slide was about 0.7 or so. But if we do have the bottom of pressure data, we get something which looks like this. It, it's an even better fit. In fact, it captures the extremes better than the other one does. And so we do add a little bit to the uh, to the fit. I think the regression on this one was uh, 0.9. But it's more than just a good fit because if we have the bottom hole pressure data, we cannot we can actually characterize the wells uh, better because we can actually calculate the productivity index for each of the producers. And here is a plot of the productivity and how it varies with time with each of the four producers. And you can see that there are down at the bottom here. There's four producers. There's a good producers, there's some that are decaying with time, and so on and so forth. Uh, quite a bit more uh, insights into the problem than just with uh, rates alone. And I have to say at this point that uh, uh, Fulker Brines, an old University of Texas professor from many years ago, would often say that pressure is a reservoir engineer's best friend, and you can definitely see that that's true. So let me go to the next primary reduction. Now, this is quite a step outside of what we originally intended on intended for CRM. We intended to map the connections between injectors and producers. But if we have pressure data, here's a slide that is the second time I've shown you this slide. If we have pressure data, we really don't need the injection data because we see fluctuations here now in the production well that are solely the result of the uh, of the changes in pressure and so we can do crm even even if there's no injection data and here's an example of, of uh, what we can do uh, this is a, a data from an omani field their geologic studies said that they thought the original home place was between 31 and 49 million barrels you can see here how, how the dynamic volumes change as you include more uh, more date, data into the fitting how the productivity index changes, but the most important thing is here, the core volume for each of the three wells. If I add these three things together, I get a number which is very much right in the middle of the uh, the, the geologic estimate. So, so it's uh, how do you can do geolog geology without geology? Well, here's a good example. It's based on production data. We can tell uh, a geologic, geologic content like a uh, concept like original oil in place. <clears throat> and uh, this is really stretching a bit. This is primary production. This is unconventional primary production where we not only get rid of the injection, we have to actually modify the production rate to uh, the, the, the productivity formula there and replace it with something that's a little more reflective of the fact that uh, un unconventional production is a lot more in the transient flow regime. Uh, there's much to be learned here, and there's a great deal of things that I'm skipping over here, but one result is the following. This is from my uh, recent graduate, uh, Leo Luis Miraji, and the figure on the left here shows both the change in bottom hole pressure with time and the change in production rate with time. And if we use CRM and match it, of course, the production, the pressure is an input and the production rate is matched. The, the matches are good, always, always very good. In fact, this is regression coefficient above, above 0.9. But in addition, we get further insights into the reservoir. Now, there's much to be said here too, uh, but we will uh, we'll just leave it at this. This is a comparison of the parameters done with bottom hole pressure to parameters done without bottom hole pressures. And here's the estimated ultimate recovery, 200,000 uh, 200, uh, 200, barrels uh, with uh, bottom hole pressure. Without bottom hole pressure, it's substantially more. 
it's a, you know over 100 percent error into the estimate of uh, EUR just because uh, we have um, uh, the, the bottom of pressures and use it. So wrapping up now, I'll show you this slide that I showed before. We we normally live in reservoir engineering in the so-called conventional world where we are interested in permeability and porosity. But in the CRM world, the flow concepts are not abandoned, but instead of instead of uh, porosity, we have time constant, and instead of permeability, we have connectivity. <clears throat> the conclusions that you saw earlier on, on uh, one of uh, uh, Jerry's slides, which, uh, which are here, and I won't, won't uh, uh, go over much more other than to highlight a couple of things. We've done a lot of cases. Uh, we've compared it to a lot of simulations. Jerry showed one of them. We've done tracer cases. So it, it matches uh, the results of numerical simulation quite, quite well. And to kind of re reiterate a bit uh, what uh, Jerry said, a simple model can and likely will be more accurate than a detailed model. <clears throat> you can read the text here about simple modeling, models using to forecast COVID-19 uh, up here. But the middle bullet here I find very interesting is that it's, it's easy to confuse verisimilitude. That is the, the, the appearance of reality with cogency, that is something which allows you to make decisions. And I'd like to submit that CRM is a cogent model and, and useful from that standpoint as well. <clears throat> We've talked about the applications and this is just the last slide to let everybody know and let me know that I'm finished. Uh, thank you very, very much for your attention and we hope that we can answer some questions. Thank you. I'm I'm going to turn my camera back on as I um, read through some of the questions we've received from our audience. Uh, Larry, I would invite you to turn your camera back on as well. Um, the first question, your node geology model sounds similar to scoping model and WAG management techniques developed over the past 30 years. WAG management based on non-modeling predictions based on pore volume throughput, scoping model techniques based on historical analogs, including dolomite, sandstone, et cetera. And both methods are good for reservoir management and future predictions. So I'm not sure if there's a question there, but uh, do you have any comment? Yeah, I'll make some comment. Of course, we're not, we're not abandoning the basic uh, ideas of reservoir engineer and pore volume and porosity and things like that. We're just trying to make more uh, uh, more use of the, uh, of the of the production data, and if I understand the qu the question correctly, uh, the volumetrics are are present in this method. It's just that we don't do it in the uh, traditional way. Jerry, do you have anything to add? Uh, no, I agree with that. Uh, you know, we're we're using the material balance method as well. So uh, anything, any horse that will get you to town is equally suitable. Great. And, and this questioner had a follow-up comment. My techniques are based on spreadsheet modeling using mass balance techniques through analog examples. Today, they're being used in both CO2, EOR management, and deep saline plume management understanding. So just a little follow-up there. Sure. So um, the next question, do you expect the CRM study model case will be different if you apply it in natural flow geopressured reservoir without any injection. You want to try that one, Jerry? Well, Larry showed a couple of, of cases where, um, where there's just primary production, there's not uh, uh, there, there's not any any additional source of energy coming into the uh, into the system, so I think uh, I think it will work uh, just as well. But you do need those pressures. Great. Yeah, I, I agree with that. The, I've been uh, trying to think of what would actually be different, and it may be that uh, some of the assumptions would be a little more shaky. Uh, for example, constant compressibility might be a little bit more shaky in a geopressure reservoir, but other than that, I can't think of what it would be. 
Okay. The next question, is there public domain CRM software or is the CRM model private or commercial use only? No, it's, it's available in the public domain as well as, as uh, service companies. Uh, one or two offer, offer it in their own uh, capacity. Uh, if you look at GitHub, um, you'll see a uh, uh, a code for for a CRM connectivity evaluation. Yeah, I think that's Frank Bale at at the Bureau of Economic Geology that did that. It, uh, so there is one on GitHub. Great. Do you have a slide that demonstrates CRM forecasts? Uh, I think Jerry showed one. This is like where you you, you predict in the future based upon uh, some data. Yes. Yeah. yeah that's uh, well. Jerry showed it. I forget what which one it was, Jerry, but it's like the second one that you showed or something like that. Right. Right. Uh, it was. It was. Uh, yeah. It was th that one field. So we had seven years of water flood history that we matched on, and then we we uh, we uh, we forward modeled. Uh, forward ran the model for another three years, so that was one well. But uh, uh, but that's the well. In 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 the early years of this technology, we spent a lot of time uh, doing exactly that. We had run a simulated. When I say simulated, I mean traditional numerical simulation, simulated case, uh, withhold half the data, fit CRM, and see if it predicted the rest of the case. So we've we've done a lot of that. So uh, he called it. Uh, what did you call it? Did you call it Jerry. We called it retrodiction, but it called uh, what's it cross called? Validation? Cross validation. Cross validation. Yeah, that's that's. <laughs> so we we've, we've done that a lot, and in fact, the truth is, my biggest fear in all of this has been that uh, is uh, been kind of the false positives is that we might be kind of kidding ourselves with uh, what we see here. But so we spent a lot of time on on validation in several different ways. Great. What are the differences of using CRM with gas injection projects versus water flood projects? Ha, huh, funny, good question. <laughs> uh, early on, uh, I had a student, Jorge Pizajo, and his uh, his task was to say, just make it break. In other words, just add <laughs> compressibility to it, and you can break it. I mean, you can get to a place where the uh, compressibility is so high that uh, the, the signals don't transmit from the injector to the producer but it seemed awfully high and uh, Jerry's worked on buck draw cases where uh, which was gas injection seems to work pretty well there so I'm, I'm not going to say that it's, it's universally applicable but it's pretty surprising how far it does go great yeah, there right. no... there was a... oh, sorry go ahead Jerry sorry, sorry Susan there was a there's a buck draw field is, uh, if I recall correctly, is in Wyoming, and it uh, it was a very light oil, 42 API, something like that, and it was a gas injection um, project there, and, and the CRM still kept ticking. Great. Are there near wellbore effects, such as damage or skin, that are included in your formulation? Well, yes. So we can. Uh, uh, we, Larry, in, in the course of this this particular presentation, uh, just showed the the, uh, the basic CRM. But but certainly uh, there are areas uh, where we have uh, we have further developed the CRM, and that includes um, changing skin with time shut-in producers and so on and uh, as it turns out she the shut-in producer case is a is a particularly interesting one because um, what we can do is we can model that as as a producer up to the shut-in time and then we model it as an injector co-located with the producer and so we're not getting any production, we're just getting injection equal to the production. And that gives us producer-producer connectivities, which uh, which are also useful in, in comparison with uh, with uh, geological modeling and so on. 
Yeah, just to add to that, uh, uh, periods of shut-in on injectors is actually pretty good because that makes the signal more rich. Uh, but uh, producers shut in, it's a little bit, as Jerry, Jerry would say, more interesting. If you have bottom hole pressures, though, that's, that effect is, is reflected in the bottom hole pressure. So you can uh, compensate for that quite a bit by having bottom hole pressures. Next question, what is the best practice to select the time window for CRM analysis for fields with many intermittent shut-in and new infill wells? Well, as uh, Larry has suggested, if we have if we have additional injectors, that's not a problem. It's if we have additional producers. Um, but there's there's uh, there's sort of a competition of, of effects here. So at the one end, you want as long a time period as possible to get the most reliable values estimated for the lambdas and taus. On the other hand, you want as short a time period as possible so that you don't get these human interventions, uh, you know, such as uh, shut-ins or, or workovers, uh, recompletions, that sort of stuff. So, there in the main course that we offer, we talk about some rules of thumb, some minimum number of, uh, of months or measurement times that, uh, that you want to get the CRM to, uh, to produce viable estimates of, uh, of lambda and tau. Um, but uh, uh, yeah, you, you, you don't want to, uh, any longer than, than necessary because things can change. And, and of course, the model does not account for human interventions. Um, see, that's outside the scope of the model. And so. Uh, so that, you know, those things, if they can be avoided, is, is a useful thing. Does CRM work for carbonates as well as for sandstones? Uh, CRM is agnostic with respect to the uh, mineral state. It doesn't work. If you have the data, it'll work. Will you cover CO2 field cases in the main course? Uh, yes. Great. So how many months of history are needed to use CRM? <laughs> the more, the better. <laughs> Jerry, you want to try? Yeah, well, so it's, um, so you have a number of parameters that you've got to, in, in your model, you've got, you've got the lambdas, you've got the taus, and so you, uh, for, so you have a certain number of unknowns that you have to uh, to evaluate, and you know the rule of thumb is you want at least four times the time periods. You want four times as the number of measurements as you have unknowns in the model. Great. Look forward to learning more about that. So I'd like to thank everyone for attending today's webinar. Uh, soon you will receive a link to a recording of today's webinar, an evaluation form, and a link to more information on the SCA class Managing Mature Oil Fields with Capacitance Resistance Modeling. That's offered September 6th through 7th in SCA's office in Houston, Texas. Thanks for joining us today. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Goodbye.